So I think it's a tribute to the quality of the presentations today that on this beautiful Saturday afternoon, many people are still here. And I think that is because they want to engage in conversation. And so this session begins the conversation, you could say, first with two kind of smaller presentations that are commentaries, one by Alex Potts first from the University of Michigan, and then Ann Wagner from uh, an emerita professor from UC Berkeley. So they will uh, speak for about 15 minutes each, and then I might ask them a question or two, or use that moment to kind of turn and pose those questions more generally or to some of the speakers. And then we're really going to elicit and encourage you to speak and to, uh, to, to get whatever comments you have right off your chests. So right to Alex. Well, like the other speakers, um, and I hope this doesn't sound ungenuine because it's been re reiterated so many times, I'm really truly grateful to, Mara, uh, uh, to Megan and Sarah in particular for bringing us all together and uh, setting in flow this kind of amazing uh, dialogue we've had today. Well, I hope it will develop into more of a dialogue um, in this last section of the uh, occasion. And I think it really, it really has done justice to the complexity and interest of this business of a kind of sculptural staging of photography and what's at issue there. Now, this commentary, it's going to be a kind of hybrid presentation. And I hope I am following, I got a, I got a sort of kind of uh, open brief <laughs> Uh, from Sarah and Megan. I was supposed to do something particularly for the occasion, but then, of course, there's a response. So what I've decided to do, um, I, when I got into it, I was going to really just sort of try to think about bringing it all together. And once I got into it, I couldn't kind of resist getting back into concerns and interest that I had about the photographic presentation of sculpture when I was doing my earlier research on uh, the sculptural imagination and on Winkelmann and the classical ideal. Now, what I will try to do, and sometimes I hope the effort won't seem too strained, is to interweave some responses to papers with this little narrative that I have devised myself. Uh, like, I think, a number of the speakers here, my central concern is thinking how the photo photographing of sculpture might function as registering not the form of a sculpture so much as an encounter with an apprehension of it. So this is a matter of considering the photographic image as an exploration of a sculptural's aesthetic qualities of asking what the photograph offers in excess of its function as a documentary record. And I'm not kind of denying that aspect of how photography of sculpture works. Now, in the 19th century, and I think this, is, this has been hinted at a number of times, I think photography brought something significantly new to the imaging of sculpture. And it's not because it offered a supposedly transparent and reliably accurate visual record. The significant point, I think, is more moderated than this. And that is that the photographic image, in comparison with a drawing or an engraving after a drawing, um, it uh, registers something um, <clears throat> It's, it's not as exhaustively mediated, and it registers something of an encounter with the work uh, photographed. Aesthetic qualities are registered that are not necessarily subsumed by the pictorial demands of graphic imaging, of two-dimensional imaging. The photo is at some level about looking at the sculpture from the viewpoint taken by the photographer and need not be seen simply as the transcription of a two-dimensional translation of its shape. And I think even with very conventional photographs like that, something like that can happen. It really depends upon your mindset as a viewer, of your trying to re... But there's no point looking at an engraving and saying, you know, how, how, where was somebody standing? How were they responding? Whereas with a photograph, you can begin to sort of say what kind of encounter is being registered here. Now, the thinking began for me <clears throat> back in the early 90s when I was looking for photographs of uh, ancient sculpture to illustrate my book on Winkelmann. And the issue was how to get away from the sort of relative aesthetic aridity of the conventionalized specimen shot 
uh, which was propagated by studios such as Alinari, which you see particularly well, I think, uh, illustrated on the right. A directly head-on view with con context uh, blotted out, lighting device to reveal the basic shape rather than subtleties of material texture and surface effect. And uh, what prompted me was I really wondered, well, if I have these photographs, how are people even going to begin to imagine why somebody like Winkelmann got so excited by these sculptures? Um, and uh, one place I went, a little bit of local history here, was I happened to be at the Getty, and um, I was just looking through the photograph collection, and there were all these Alinari photos, and I was in a hurry to get some illustrations. I got some nice ones from the German Archaeological Institute, which had been done just after the war, and were in a slightly different, more kind of appealing mode. And I came across this George Stone collection, who's an interesting photographer who went around Italy in the 20s and 30s, I suspect with a very slight or maybe even fairly charged homoerotic interest in the sculptures concerned. And he did some really intriguing and amazing, slightly unusual photos. I tried to reproduce one for you, but unfortunately, the scanner I had was so crappy <laughs> that it, it just would have destroyed the effect to show you. But I just, he did, I used an Antinous, which is very different from that, and has a kind of, you know, strangely delicate beauty, which is sort of aestheticized, but at least sort of says something about the interest the sculpture might have sparked in a viewer. Um, and I think that what, what's going on here is you first have, I think there was a sort of moment in the later 19th century when uh, agencies such as Alinari and Anderson and Brun Brookman standardized the format for these picturings of sculpture with a black background, and these sort of became fixed in place. And then these images became even cruder as a result of their reproduction in half bad half-tone images in the last decade of the 19th century and first decade of the 20th century. So there's this sort of something, I think, quite interesting going on there. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of interested in sort of pushing a little bit before this history. Um, and um, I think saying this, uh, we've all been denigrating the kind of view we have here. Um, and talking to Joel, um, I was aware that when we were looking at a display of such photographs, there are some very interesting differences. A lot of care and craftsmanship has gone into the quality standards imposed upon these. Uh, different pinting processes produce different kind of subtleties of uh, gray tone and uh, uh, subtleties of shading. Um, so I think there is actually work to be done on these as registers of certain kinds of aesthetic interests in the sculptures. Um, but um, that is not my task right now. I became particularly intrigued by looking through various books on photography and sculpture by what I saw as the imaginatively charged encounters with sculpture um, in the mid-19th century photographs, um, encounters that were effectively edited out of the standard kind of head-on view, which you see represented here. And I began from this to get a sense of a 19th century sculptural imaginary that was very much at odds with the prevalent view that sculpture in the 19th century, and we've had this come up several times today, was increasingly seen as a rather dead and conventional classicizing art by comparison with painting. And there was, in fact, a very definite sculptural imaginary. And I suppose to give you one incredibly crude example, if you just think of something like Hawthorne's The Marble Fawn, uh, there is a sort of, there is a real imaginative staging of sculpture. So I'm just going to go through various examples of this kind of slightly alternative viewing of sculpture. Um, <clears throat> One sees in quite a, in a number of the prints, such as the uh, Michelangelo Alinari print, uh, which was done in uh, uh, 1880, about 1880, you can see there there's a real attempt to give you a different view of the sculpture, which brings out something different about it. And I like this one, because it gives you a view you could never ever have if you went to see the sculpture. It's high up, but it still gives, because it destabilizes the standard specimen view that you see on the left, which I is kind of nice that it's done from a cast. Um, <clears throat> uh, uh, 
uh, because it destabilizes that specimen view, it, it gives you a sense of the, the sculpture sort of comes alive in a way it doesn't through the standard photos. And of course, it's very skillfully lighted to bring out the, uh, the qualities of the modeling, which don't really emerge in the more flat head-on view. Um, <clears throat> And another good example of this, I think, um, is the, um, uh, this uh, Anderson view uh, taken from 1853. And I think the photographer very deliberately slightly skewed the head-on view in order to give the sculpture a kind of liveliness. And what struck me as very interesting about this is that it's almost as if he was responding to what the final, the actual pose of the arm should be. Because from this angle, the arm is brought in a little bit closer to the head, and it corresponds more to the, the, the correct arm that was found later on. And again, he has, he's gone on, he's gone in for some, the photographer has gone in for some very dramatic play with light and shadow, which is sort of, it's a sort of interesting case of it being artificial, and yet through that artificiality conveyed something of a response to the, mar the, the, the modeling qualities of the marble, um, and it's his own way of trying to make it come alive. I should actually add that my bad <laughs> Uh, uh, my bad scan of it doesn't quite do uh, uh, justice to the, uh, the subtlety of the work. And that was, that was sort of interesting to discover when I was doing these scans, which comes back to a point that Joel was bringing up on a number of occasions, um, that there is, this, there is this business of this transformation of a photograph as it's printed, as it's reprinted, as it's reproduced, as it's scanned. And there's these dramatic differences in light and tone, uh, light and shade contrast, and so on and so forth, which make each of these really very different. Um, <clears throat> now, the, um, Another area that it seems to me very, seems to me particularly interesting, which Britt, which Britt Salverson has really touched on and discussed in some detail, is the way that there, in the very early days of photography, the days of the daguerreotype, Bayard's strange uh, uh, one print photographs, um, statue, the photographing of statuettes became a way of experimenting with photographic imaging. Um, so the purpose of these was not to provide mechanical reproductions of works of art. Uh, these were exercises in photography, aestheticized exercises in photography that found statuettes particularly appropriate to these attempts to show up the particular qualities of photography and what it could do. Um, and, um, I mean, I've chosen two here. I mean, this is, I, I, I love this lovingly staged La Quan uh, statuette um, with, the, with the kind of nice um, uh, textile covered uh, underlay to the base uh, and the careful kind of placing of the curtains, which actually, if we go back to the Anderson, you can see he was still using that effect in order to create a more interesting background. Um, and, um, and the one on the right is uh, characteristic of a number of works at this particular time, where the statuettes were set up in a kind of dialogue with one another. There's the Capitoline Antinous is engaged in some kind of dialogue with the Venus de' Medici on this very small scale. And I suppose the small scale is important because it, it enables this sort of manipulation and staging. And I suppose in, in a very kind of distant way, we have something that is a little bit of a precedent to those weird studio photographs you get in the early 20th century when sculptures, and actually even in some early, in some photographs of Rodin sculpture, where photographs of sculpture were setting up sculptures in dialogue with one another. These people, of course, couldn't do it with full-scale statues. Um, uh, they couldn't photograph at this stage satisfactory photograph full-scale statues uh, because they wouldn't be able to control the lighting conditions and so on and so forth. Um, and statuettes did much better. Now, there's another side to the statuette, which I think is really very interesting. And it, it was brought out to me when I heard a couple of talks about the Hiram Powers Greek slave girl. Um, this was initially reproduced in kind of jewel-like 
uh, daguerreotypes. Um, and these were done from statuette reproductions or statuette versions of the Hiram Power sculpture. Um, but what is, what is really, I think, particularly dramatic about the one on the left, which I think says something about a particular kind of viewing of sculpture at the time, it's put into a little case rather like a locket. And I think what it's doing is putting the image, it's putting the sculpture, not just the image of the sculpture, into the hands of the viewer uh, on the one hand as a personal uh, possession, but I think more importantly as the source of a private and intimate experience. So this is converting the encounter with the sculpture into a private and intimate experience with this reduced, this small scale precious object. And this is of course I think evident not just in these daguerreotype images, but it's also evident in the huge circulation of these small reproductive statuettes, often done in rather bad materials, so they, not many of them have survived, um, and, and I think was a very important part of the sculptural imaginary of the time. We also, yes, I mean, I was, um, I was just got some notes here that I wanted to, um, yeah, I think this is, the, it's maybe a tiny bit of a long shot, but um, I was thinking about how, how does Chris Penny's paper fit into this, into our concerns, and I thought in a way there's one, one parallel here with the sort of longer history of the uh, photographic imaging of sculpture, and that is this fascination with moving with the photograph, I think, more as, I've only got one minute, I thought I started late. I, th I thought it was just before quarter two. I mean, when I first looked at my watch, I thought I have another three or four minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's this move from two to three, to three dimensions and something about the photograph being an imprint which conveys something of what the object is or the imaginative idea is from one a medium transformation to another. Um, <clears throat> Now, I'll just go through this very quickly. Um, there's also, of course, another side, which is really another new response in the 19th century, was the response to the displays of sculpture in uh, international exhibitions and in the new public galleries. Uh, in 1855, a series of fascinating photographs seem to have been commissioned to, um, to sort of register the display of um, uh, plaster replicas of famous modern sculptures uh, in the uh, Sydenham Crystal Palace, uh, which had been moved from Hyde Park up to Sydenham. And I just, I, he sort of struck me because I just love the way, I think, and I think actually partly consciously, uh, the photographer here um, has the Mars and Venus by Canova snogging away over here. And then you've got these austere uh, allegorical figure kind of up against them. And here, this is, I think, again, a deliberately comic juxtaposition or kind of intriguing juxtaposition of these various female nudes going through different gestures. Um, uh, uh, so this is this idea of a, a sort of momentary, contiguous uh, vision of the sculpture that you come across, which is also reflected in these images of sculptures in parks. Now, I've only got a minute or two. I'm going to have to leave out a little bit of what I was going to talk about, but I just want to finish off with one very general point which relates, I think, in a way to uh, Darcy's talk about the uh, close and distant view because that is also a part of sculptural viewing, and it's also something that photography has both ignored and also dealt with, the idea of taking an overall view of a sculpture and then giving you a close-in view which slightly disperses the overall view and gives you a sense of the material qualities and textures of the sculpture. And the, the, you know, when I started working on neoclassical sculpture, this is the kind of image you generally got. And it was really only in the 1990s one started getting these amazing series of commissioned photographs, uh, which are doing precisely that, trying to give you a vivid sense of the surface and material qualities of the sculpture um, that the simple overall view doesn't give. Now, <clears throat> Uh, and this kind of, I think, this kind of viewing of sculpture uh, and this kind of uh, photographic taken sculpture was something 
uh, I think, which, for which, in which Henry Moore played a very large role. That the early, early photographs of Henry Moore are among the earlier photographs that really attempt to give you this kind of, to dramatize this kind of close view. Um, and I think I will just slip to the very end here. Um, and this is, this is just to try to wind out and, and to tie some of these observations together with some of the more contemporary uh, or later references we've had to sculpture and the use of imaging. Um, this sort of moment, which was the moment of, you know, Herbert Reed's The Art of Sculpture and that sort of thing, this was the moment which you could, the, the 18, 1950s and 60s, was a moment when um, you could say that modern sculpture really came into its own. It became, a, a, there was a sort of notion of a classic modern sculptural object, and there was also some very inventive photographing, which I think these two examples dramatize rather nicely, of uh, trying to dramatize a particular encounter with a sculpture, uh, as well as to kind of dramatize its specific aesthetic qualities. Um, and I suppose the irony, in my view, is that this happened just at the time when avant-garde initiatives started actually denying and displacing the sculptural object um, in various successive ways through the 60s and 70s. And to finish off, I was just going to say that what I think is rather interesting is that now these avant-garde strategies have become mainstream to the extent that they're not really challenging things. And I think, um, I think in the end, Irene Small's talk on Tina Segal brought that out rather nicely. Uh, what one has is a sort of intriguing situation where the making of sculptural objects of a sort of, you know, in a sort of more traditional form, perhaps, is a strong and viable presence within the contemporary art scene and recognized as such at the same time as you have all these other alternative practices. So the, the standard narrative of the end of sculpture just doesn't work. And the reason I'm bringing it up, not, it's not because I want to make a big appeal for you know, traditional sort of sculptural object making, it's um, that I think this is what makes this history that we've been looking at here of the aestheticizing and the photographic presentation of sculpture so interesting to us now. It's not just a historical interest. It's an interest which has some real engagement with something that's going on in the contemporary art world and with the contemporary sculptural imaginary. Thank you. As everyone has been speaking, um, I've been thinking about how long it's been now that my life is, now that I'm retired, that I actually spend a day um, with other people uh, talking about ideas and uh, thus I want to thank um, not only Megan and Sarah but I'd also really like to thank my fellow speakers um, and the Getty and the audience as well. Um, this is why actually I'm going to start out by saying that before this conference I spent ages trying to conjure some sort of image which would stand for me for what we were going to do here. Um, I couldn't get started until I had this image in mind. It is part of how I think, alas, and I sort of had this idea that we were going to be marking a confluence, which is why I immediately put, chose a confluence to be on the screen, the generic image of two rivers, great except for the fact that this is completely wrong because what we're actually here to talk about is the intersection of distinctive technologies. In the case of sculpture, uh, those technologies take part in the long tradition of material forming, whereas photography lies in the equally long tradition and history of optical framing. I think these are the differences that played into their instant affinity. Uh, it's as if, you know, opposites attract. Uh, this is where I even had a pun for a while. You know, it's like ça fait clique uh, to do the photographic thing. Um, but these oppositions, as I think our work has shown us, have not been entirely resolved. Sculpture's determinant physicality is always at odds. It continues to be at odds with what, in 1963, Hubert Damisch defined as photography's 
paradoxical approach to physical form, its existence, I quote, as an image without thickness or substance, in a way, entirely unreal. The paradox emerges, Damish says, in the fact that for all its immateriality, the photograph manages to exist, I quote again, without disclaiming the notion that it retains something of the reality from which it was somehow released. Now look, immediately let's all agree that um, Damish was absolutely blind to the photograph as thing, if only he had been with us uh, yesterday in special uh, collections. Its materiality, uh, at least before digitality, defined its visibility, so I, pro I guess it still does now. It was how it could be seen. Yet, I still persist in thinking that Damish's paradox, his idea of a somehow unreal image which somehow manages to release an object's reality for its own use, for the use of the image, that is, offers a particularly helpful way to conceive of the problem we face. We might even consider uh, inscribing Damish's phrases on the imaginary steely I imagined marking the confluence of uh, uh, these two technologies in our work today so as not to declare that a photograph reproduces a sculpture, which is at best a half-truth, but that it releases at least some of a sculpture's reality while keeping some for itself. In other words, what I want to hold on to from Damish's definition is its poetics above all. What does it mean to think of a photograph releasing an object's reality? How does it matter that the object is a sculpture? We've seen how much this is a time when sculpture's objecthood, let alone its claims on permanence, is far from obvious. Its public presence as other than comedy and spectacle butt plugs and balloon dogs is over and done. Meanwhile, photography has become as disposable as it is omnipresent. Instagrams, selfies, swarming, swarming into the gap opened within the social fabric where they live and die like blowflies hatching in a corpse. <laughs> Who among us is still framing our family snaps? Is it still possible under these new conditions to begin to imagine what it was like to see the very first photographs? Nature's marvels, they were called, and fairy pictures and natural magic, a language all the more poignant when we remember that their magic was conjured from windows and brooms. A window. These were the photographs made at Laycock Abbey in the 1830s and 40s where William Henry Fox Talbot performed his first experiments in photography. Nowadays the magic made at this site is of the Hogwarts variety. It was twice used as a Harry Potter set, but that fate can't overshadow the magnitude of Fox Talbot's discoveries or sculpture's role in his work. Nothing new here, which is why scholars go back and back to these first calotypes. Among them, Joel Snyder and Peter Geimer, of course, but also Larry Scharf and Susan L. Sylvester, Sylvester and Russell Roberts and Rosanna Markoch. Nor have any of them shirked the obligatory task of underscoring the role in the Laycock Abbey pictures of one particular plaster cast. Whoops. This one, you've seen it before, made from a Hellenistic marble in the British Museum and perhaps purchased there too, given that the museum was selling plaster reproductions of its collection as early as 1838. Now I hasten to say that Fox Talbot's isn't among this selection, which are casts of the um, 
Parthenon uh, uh, sculptures, um, nor does anyone seem certain why it was thought to represent Achilles' boon companion, Patroclus, whose death spurred, as you remember from your education, spurred the sulking Achilles uh, into battle at Troy. Marcotte says the label was Fox Talbot's fanciful invention, but if this is the case, the name still speaks directly to how much this one plaster aided his work. The assistance it provided extends uh, far beyond proving the powers of photography, though it does this compellingly, which, it's, which is why it is the only subject illustrated twice in the pencil of nature. But this isn't all. I was staggered to learn that at a time when every image was an experiment, Fox Talbot actually made at least 55 different negatives and an untold number of prints of this otherwise fairly insignificant bust. Let me add another one to the group. There's a profligacy here which testifies to photography's first discovering its ability not just to record an image, but also to claim to stand in for an object. Here's where Joel Snyder termed its rhetoric, what Joel termed its rhetoric of substitution first came into play. Yet that rhetoric doesn't speak to Fox Talbot's ongoing labors. His patient plaster kept on posing again and again, in the process offering a practical demonstration that sculpture serves photography as an elusive and inexhaustible subject. Its images can't simply reproduce or substitute for its sculptural sitters. Instead, it established that this really can't be done. No single image of a sculpture is enough. To Fox Talbot's lasting credit, he recognized that this was a defining quality of sculpture, one that was hard to find or not worth finding in the other subjects he used as models. Works like Articles of China on Four Shelves from 1844 emerged as one-off images. One photograph and the interest was spent. Of course, it makes sense, as Russell Roberts has argued, to think of these pictures as constituting an imaginary museum. In fact, we've spent a day really looking at imaginary museums, Malraux avant la lettre. But in the Patroclus photographs, but the Patroclus photographs collect a single object, an object chosen for its stasis, which then stands its mutability revealed. Again, to his credit, Fox Talbot not only saw what was happening, but he also tried to spell it out. I quote, the delineations of sculpture are susceptible to an almost unlimited variety. And this is true in my voice now. And this is true depending on the position, of, no, his voice, I'm sorry. This is true depending on the position of each sculptural object with regard to the sun. The question for us, I think, still rests in our readiness to understand sculpture's almost unlimited variety as both fundamental to the medium and somehow independent of the camera's mediating interventions. If in the 19th century, the camera released sculpture's reality, again Damish, that reality is not dispelled or dissipated. Instead, it still exists somewhere, transforming our concepts of sculpture and time. Now I realize that my image of release and capture may lead these few comments astray. So I want to try to state more directly 
why Fox Talbot's devotion to Patroclus and vice versa continues to mean so much to both photography and sculpture. Ironically, to do so, I need to change our terms, and I'll change our image too. And I'll show you the last of the ones that I know at the time. I'm new to this field, as you can see. I want to make our terms now more explicitly a matter of time. For time is the reality that Fox Talbot's homemade apparatus released. Time as now transformed by the repeated intersections of a single, single sculptural object, a bust as conveniently replaceable as it was symbolic, and a primitive camera its user had mostly made himself. And I do mean transformed. Installed at the origins of photography is a new calculus or mechanism which immediately converts the time of photography into the past of the image. While the ideal of immutability of sculpture is left in ruins for all time. Here it might be useful to remember that in an essay on Jeff Wall, Bryony Fair remarks that the shifting tenses of photographic representation tend towards the already seen and already known, and puts this in contrast with the minimalist view of the now of sculpture, as she puts it, or paraphrasing Robert Morris, sculpture's present tense. One purpose of these observations is to suggest that sculpture took up its place in the present long ago. No doubt it was there from the start, if difficult to see. But recognizing sculpture's contingency became a phenomenon of modernity, of assistant, assisted vision and the overthrow of governments, of monuments brought to the ground. It takes quite specific conditions to grasp past and present and specific skills too. Baudelaire couldn't, we know. Two years after Fox Talbot released The Pencil of Nature, the poet reviewed the Paris Salon. It was an occasion that led him famously and peevishly to ask why sculpture is annoying, ennuyeux. To be fair, the explanation he offers is spatial and perceptual. Sculpture has too many surfaces and worse, a hundred points of view. And then he declares, I'm now citing him directly. And it often happens that a trick of the light, an effect produced by a lamp, and he says, an hasard de lumière, an effet de lampe, may discover a beauty that is not at all the one the artist had in mind which is to say that sculpture is annoying as a function of its nowness. To be so fully present is to offer an unanswerable challenge to any prosaic conception of the real. If at this point we were to return our attention to the problem of marking this site, it's clear that such a construction could only be both real and surreal, present and absent, physical and metaphysical, a changing object in the world. Why else do sculptors, Brancusi is, whoops, why are over there? Hello, Brancusi. Brancusi is only the most vivid example. Why do they insist on photographing their own work? Effects like these look special, movie style, but record circumstances. They record the facts. The result is explosive because it destroys the myth of reproduction in favor of an image of sculpture's 
momentary presence in time. Whatever we think of sculpture, its illusions, its objecthood, the reality, like reality itself, is far from simple, or at least not as simple as we often allow ourselves to think. So we're going to open up uh, the, the conversation, but because I get to moderate this, I get to kind of ask the first questions, which are really, of course, fake questions, because they're comments. Um, but they'll be brief. Uh, but it is also, I hope, to help uh, perhaps suggest some topics for the conversation. Both Alex and Anne actually hit on one of the questions that I think is important and that might not have been what you would have imagined. Do we have enough seats? Um, emerged. Do we have enough seats? Speciality. the keys the piano. We can all move over this way. Hi. Uh, it's like yeah, we can just slide. We're a musical <laughs> room. Okay. Are we all? Yes. Okay, so where once I think we might have imagined that our conversation would hinge on questions of temporality and spatiality, it's very clear that opticality and materiality uh, emerged as interesting, an interesting pair. And I guess I just want to also warn us or uh, at least raise a challenge that they are not in fact opposites, that opticality does not to me imply non-materiality, although I think we've so far mostly seen it that way, so I think we'd want to think about those two terms and how they are not in opposition and in particular I'd kind of challenge that opposition by thinking about people's productive suspension of such distinctions. My own experience uh, with this has to do with wax museums claiming to you know, represent the newspaper three-dimensionally and very effectively, and then eventually it's entirely replaced by film and everyone is happy with that. And so why I raise this is to say that one possibility that we also have not discussed is the way the photograph assumes the social work in modernity uh, that sculpture once had. So in other words, we've been looking at you know, photographs of sculptures, et cetera. But actually, there's a relationship between these forms that are not simply also uh, in dialogue, but also in a historical relationship to each other where there's a little more, I think, aggression and tension and a story that I think we could talk a little bit more about here, the social function of uh, sculpture being replaced in some ways happily by consumers uh, with photography. We had very little in our conversations today about the uses and practices regarding these images. In other words, we've seen them. It's not that people didn't mention it, but that wasn't their purpose. So press photos, in a sense, the Dan Flavin images were press photos. We haven't talked about how photography functions as press for sculpture, and what difference does it make if it's a press photo versus an archive photo, et cetera. We've seen propaganda, the Hitler images, uh, the edutainment that Britt Salveson kind of talked about in general. So in other words, this is photography's materiality. And one of the things we want to look at is the human photo interaction, and the question is, how is it different if the photo is of sculpture? Is there some particular human photo interaction that because the photograph is a sculpture is different? And I think Jeremy Melius' uh, presentation also suggested that when he kind of skated towards the erotic uh, relationship uh, of those uh, photos to uh, Hildebrand's uh, erotic relationship to that. So we've also, and I think Alex, you, you raised this, what I would call the um, prosthetic dimension of photography, that photography is a prosthesis for the viewer. And so it's either prescriptive, that's the kind of old fashioned Foucauldian idea of what photography does, but it also substitutes and gives us something we can't ordinarily have. And this is not only the erotic, but the better view, and you can think of Kenneth Clark's civilization swooping around the David where you cannot go. I mean, I would say that film then actually does this even better and more dramatically, or the opening of the agony in the and the ecstasy, which is a 15-minute 3D cinemascope tour of Rome, where you really are, again, flying literally with the camera. And I think sculpture is the favorite object that these cameras uh, go around. So then, and we've seen different kinds of photography for which we're grateful. We've had 3D photography, lenticular photography, which of course is an old form of photography. I wondered if you know Chris thought about that in relationship to the Indian 
specificity because there's been lenticular photography for a long time. The last two things I will say is we didn't really talk too much about color photography. In other words, not only you know, when, when there is color photography, what difference does it make? Of course, we have polychrome sculpture, but all sculpture has color, even if it's not, as it were, polychrome. And so what difference does it make when the photos are color? When does Alnari, for example, start photographing in color, and what difference does that make? And finally, I would introduce to color movement, which is to say both moving pictures. So again, photography has a, you know, moving uh, twin, uh, you know, called the movies, and I think that that could be relevant to us, especially in asking about moving sculpture. In particular, I've been working on kinetic art and kinetic sculpture. And again, that's a form that we didn't talk about and that I think could present problems. You know, how to photograph your kinetic sculpture, uh, you know, is, is always an issue. So those are some brief things I just want to throw on the table, and I think maybe we'll take it over to the audience, and then people can kind of, you know, respond as it goes around, okay? Great. So, questions. Hector? Hi, um, this question is for uh, Darcy. Um, I really enjoyed your talk, and I was thinking about the black room, the allegory of the black room, and that conception of form as there, there are no objects until light pierces through, which is such a different conception of form from the one you laid out in the, st in the um, Stone Mountain, um, right, which is so abstracted, which is so much about imposing a kind of set of objects onto a screen. Um, so different from the kind of the black box. And I'm, you did such a good job um, unpacking the uncanny materiality of these two projects. But I wonder if you just might briefly hypothesize about kind of what's driving in the Stone Mountain um, project this need to affix such a kind of dematerialized, abstracted idea of photography onto sculpture. Oh, Hector. <laughs> My beloved Hector, <laughs> former undergrad at Berkeley. Uh, can I rise to the uh, job here? You're asking me. I'm not sure. Um, I don't think that the notion of um, that dematerialized sort of optical model of sculpture inside that box, that glowing head, is of such a different order from the projected, the continual projection of these, frankly, extremely, you know, tonally modulated, imprecise um, photographs of the, of the shallow relief onto the mountain. There's such, I mean, so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer you, Hector. I'm not sure. I think you have something more specific in mind that I'm it, able to. It is, in fact, tonally modulated, but he pretends as though it isn't, right? Yeah, he pretends and as so though it what, isn't. And so what's driving this kind of need to fix a detonalized idea of objects onto? The mountain. Yeah. Well, I mean, he is a sculptor, as was his brother, and he thinks this is going to be his claim to fame. So, I mean, ultimately, what I think is really interesting is that ultimately all he's supposed to do is sculpt, right? And yet when you read how engineering and the engineering problems to be met in mountain sculpture, you see the extent to which what really excited him was photographic projection. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a shortcut um, that he thought would be a kind of easy translation all, you know, first, I mean, he's absurd with the actually turning the mountain into a photograph, but even when he realizes that's not possible and he's projecting the image onto the mountain, I think he's falling prey to a belief that, you know, making it will be in some way continuous with the facility, the ease with which he projected it. And as I say, one of the biggest problems there is that the relief projects as though it extends out from the surface when what he's gonna have to do is create a gash in the surface to allow figuration to appear. I still don't think I've answered your question, um, no, Hector. That's, that's very helpful. Okay. Yeah. Could I just add to that that there are lots of early Buddhist um, examples of um, uh, photographs of the Buddha in caves. I mean, they're the traces of shadows. So, I mean, one could frame it historically and cross-culturally in ways that make your guy Guy's project seems slightly less absurd. <laughs> I mean, you yes. present it as a case. Should we of, do that? Well, no. You, you, you very amusingly present it as a case of American exceptionalism, whereas uh, to my ears, it sounded rather um, 
plausible and um, <laughs> overly widespread. <laughs> I'll bear that in mind, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure I want Borglum to get off by, um, you know, our from our indictment of his what Anne has pointed out several times today: stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> right, Anne. <laughs> question. There's a question there. Uh, this question is for Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy, you discussed at length um, Hildebrand's uh, photograph of his three daughters. And I wanted to ask for your clarification whether that photograph is meant to be for public consumption and discussion, or whether it was meant to be a model so that he can utilize it for his work. Mm -hmm. Because it would help me understand whether the shadows in the background and, and the side is, is, is utilitarian. Uh, what do, you, what do you mean by utilitarian? Well, I think in, in your um, title um, regarding, uh, excuse me, the title is Sculpture from Behind. Yes. If it, if it is dark from behind, it, it provides great contrast to, to see the outline of the bodies. Yes. But if it's meant to be a uh, piece of art for discussion, then that's, a very, that's, a, that's part of the art itself. Yeah. Okay. I see. I see what you mean. Um, yeah. It's, they were not. I mean, they were not exhibited. Um, they. They. I don't think they were intended ever to be exhibited. I'm not sure they. They were exactly m intended as models, though. Um, the sort of. I mean, he was interested in transferring. Uh, you know, at least in that one kind of plaster sketch that I showed, something of their poses to this fountain project. Um, but. Um, it's not exact, right? It's sort of not, it's, it's not an exact transfer. Um, the positionality of the bodies in relation to each other was not uh, at all kind of um, related. And so, and so I think it was, it, was, um, it, was a, it was a way of kind of thinking uh, through this issue of relief um, for him. Um, I think that's sort of what I was trying to suggest. Um, the, and I, it's very difficult to tell looking at the photographs um, even sort of whether the, 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 so they're in a doorway, whether that door is open or shut. Um, so dark is the shadow uh, uh, behind them. But I, but I do think, my sense is it was kind of uh, shadow in the space, that it sort of, it, it wasn't kind of, that he didn't doctor it in some way to, to kind of bring out their form. Maybe, so I don't know if that helps here. Yeah. Well, one, one of the things that this, uh, question uh, provokes for me, uh, especially in the way that it, you know, f what was it, what was to become of this? How, what use value did it have? Did it, was it published? Um, is the way it cuts across your questions to us, um, which really very much focus on the idea of reproduction as a means of public communication and the, circ the public circulation of imagery of, um, I, I, or imagery or imagery as entertainment or the kind of hybridization of those two uh, categories. Um, and I think one of the things which is, uh, which I, I want to sort of push into the front, and that is that reproduction, which such as it is, you know, with, with all of its limits, is very much also, a, you know, a private investigative means for, for artists and sculptors. And so this is sort of the unseen or the now seen uh, submerged body of, I think it's a much greater body of work in some ways um, with which artists investigated and also imagined and um, counterfactualized and dreamt with their work. And you know, as a sculpture historian, it's very evident I think from my intervention how much I want to hold on to that element of fantasy, but I also feel like one of the things I wanted to do in my intervention was to insist that even, you know, that even the published photograph, that there is a poetics of the mass communicate of mass communication and that that also should be a subject mm -hmm. for investigation. Mm -hmm. um, and can I just follow up on that too? It's um, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about with 
the history of photography, and Joel's remarks really raised this for me, is how photography's own history is really split between our expectations that it reproduce the world or reproduce a kind of encounter or experiences, as Alex was talking about in his remarks, versus its auto-reproduction, right? The reproduction of images in, in, in this sort of dissemination of an image in a mass circulatory um, wor you know, sort of um, environment. And so that there's, um, you know, it seems as if the history of photography has long privileged the reproduction of a real or the reproduction of the world rather than this auto-reproduction. And I've sensed throughout the day that there has been a theme or kind of tension between what Chris had talked about with when he invokes the words like template and prototype versus identical copies, which is what Joel was saying, you know, they never existed. And so that dream or that desire of the same thing reproduced en masse versus our good enough approximation of some sort of generality. And it seems as if that ideal or that um, the kind of an idealist model for what sculpture is, that the ideal body and that we're constantly sculpting to approximate a kind of general sense of embodiment or something like this might also be haunting our discussions about photography as well. That it seems like template and prototype on the one hand or idealism and generality on the one hand versus identical copies um, as, part, as a kind of rift in the rhetoric all across the day might also interestingly map onto this kind of dual identity of photography as reproducing the world and also reproducing itself. Does that make any sense or if, I don't know if that um, connects with what other people are thinking, but it seems as if it's a kind of red thread that's moved throughout many of the remarks today, something that we're kind of struggling, like what is being copied and is it even a copy? And that's mm -hmm. constantly being challenged by what are these images that we're dealing with? And it's something specific about the sculptural object that make us doubt whether these images are even sort of these kinds of faithful copies or auto reproductions mm -hmm. to begin mm -hmm. with. So I mean, I think, Megan, there's another point that comes out of that that a number of the, the papers touched on because, I mean, Anne raised the issue of the sort of, let's say, the materiality of photography, of the materiality of photography as a practice and a form of image making and the materiality of sculpture intersect, collide, and are in tension with one another. Um, because what I think Joel kind of revealed rather nicely is that even the things that we dismiss as reproductions involve a lot of work. Yeah. And what's interesting about the photographic image is that it often conceals the amount of work that's gone into it, uh, the various layers of printing, and, uh, and not just the staging of the sculpture in front of it. Um, and I think it would be worth thinking about whether there isn't some kind of both attention and parallel with what's going on in sculpture. Because in a sense, um, I mean, particularly carved sculpture removes a lot of the traces of the work that's gone into it. We, didn't, we don't see the dynamite in Mount Rushmore. I mean, it's really, it's really interesting. So in fact, there is a sort of, there's another sort of subterranean issue about these things that take a huge amount of work and decisions and refinements that are not seen and not appreciated by so many of the viewers that look at it. And what are we doing when we focus on these kind of refinements? I think that's part of our job as artists historians to do that. But at the same time, there's the fact that these are taken as instantaneously available finished things um, that, um, that don't quite bear the traces of often the incredibly complex mm -hmm. mechanized processes mm -hmm. that go into their making. Well, I mean, by the same token, um, and this came up for us when we, we met looking at things as a group yesterday. Um, we don't have the mechanisms really to provide a sufficient account or even maybe an introductory account um, to uh, particular consumptions or uses of images after they're in the world. And, um, you know, that I think it's easy for us to forget in our um, responsible materialism of, uh, of a life. Uh, of a life before image saturation, you know, when a house had X number of books and the ones with the pictures in them meant an enormous amount and were poured over and used and gone back to and drawn in and, you know, yeah. had 
consequences for people who use them. And that's some of the aspects of, of reproduction and photography uh, that surely is kind of the most um, deeply consequential, mm -hmm. you know, that, that which is actually why these things existed, because people were able to feed themselves on, you know, these, these virtualities. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, I mean, that's the thrill of the book, and that, that you know, and as well as the thrill of the photograph. Mm -hmm. Maybe Justin? I, I want to ask there. a question. Yeah. Um, and then Justin. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long question, though, Justin. I can <laughs> um, so I want to I want to go back to something that's come up several times today, and which is asking us to think a little bit historically about the ways in which this question of the photography of sculpture has shifted. This came up in both of Alex, both Alex's and Anne's. Uh, responses. Alex said, you know, there's, I think, I'm not going to get your words exactly, but something along the lines of, is it possible that we're only thinking about this now because of contemporary problems in practice or issues in contemporary practice and, and talking about the very, um, the very material ways in which the technologies of sculpture and photography have shifted. So I wanted to ask some of our speakers to reflect on this because it, it came up numerous times um, uh, between Joel's, uh, the last images that Joel showed. I'm sort of wondering, are those completely reliant on the photograph? Would that project be possible without the idea of the photograph which can stabilize that view from a very particular point of view, or, or from, from stabilize that work from a very particular point of view? Um, and and um, does that change our understanding of that work? Because we're not looking at it in sculptural space. We're not looking at it in space. Um, what does it mean to encounter that work in space versus through the photograph? or thinking about um, Jeffrey's uh, talk, which thinks about the reliance and the, the kind of dispensability of the photograph. You talked about how um, Morris you know, takes photography for granted in some ways. And um, how do we talk about his definition of what sculpture is as possibly relying on this very schematic mode of presenting his work in those, um, in those photographs. So what I'm asking us to think about is how, how do, I guess to go back to the question that Benjamin raised, that, we, that uh, Megan and I talked about in our introduction, which is how do we think about sculptural practice as changing by virtue of photography um, in the 20th century? And is this a way in which Alex and Anne, as historians of sculpture, are thinking about sculpture? Is this a way that you have been thinking about your projects? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, would, I would almost like to frame it slightly differently. Mm -hmm. It's making, I mean, it's photographic image makes possible and also blanks out certain possibilities of how sculpture is viewed. So I think it's a complex, obviously, the, I mean, I think, I think that's the mediation that really matters. Mm -hmm. It poses a question about how it's being viewed and, well, and not just how it's being captured mm -hmm. as image. And I suppose I would, I would come back to, I suppose, what I got very interested in historically thinking about it was just the fact that those, I mean, it was the duration involved in those early photographs, the effort that had to go into it and the experimental nature of them mm -hmm. meant that there was a kind of experimentation with what you could make of mm -hmm. sculpture, which I think was very interesting. Mm -hmm. And it was a product of that particular moment. It was the product of an intersection of certain technologies mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and there again, you know, that dramatizing of the statuette as a way of looking at a sculpture, you know, you're looking at the big sculpture through the statuette almost. And I think that then actually also shifts sculptural practice. And I think one could, one could I mean, I was just thinking with um, Jeremy's talk uh, um, that what you have there is a very interesting return to a really, really literal notion of the photograph as just a document, as a mugshot of the sculpture, you know, that it's, it's sort of weeding out all that aestheticizing of the sculptural projection, which I was showing with the, uh, 
uh, with the uh, Henry Moores. And it goes, I think, I think that that's where one's dealing with something really interesting. Jer I mean, I just wish we'd had more chance to talk about Jeremy's kind of discussion of the, the Wolflinian and Hildebrandtian take on sculpture, because that, again, is something, it's a way of viewing sculpture in terms of the principal view. It's not saying the principal view is the only thing, mm -hmm. but how does that produce a particular kind of thinking about mm -hmm. sculpture mm -hmm. and the possibilities of sculpture? So that what photography does does is kind of shine the light on different sculptural possibilities and plays off with and against sculptural taste. And I think there is an amazing history. I mean, I, I imagine that's the history you're tracing in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would, <clears throat> it's a very different, it's a, it's, a, it's a different problem when applied to work after a certain date, say roughly 1960. And um, in my case, I was thinking, very much of uh, recuperating the idea of the sculptor, of, sorry, as the photograph as a document, uh, in order to um, unpack the, the, sorry, to unpack the, um, the significance of, of uh, photographic inventory, um, which still, still counts, I mean, no matter what else we say about interpreting the photograph uh, as, a, as a motivated image or as an intens intensively made thing, they still function and they have all day long, when we let our guard down for everybody, they have all day long still functioned as records of, of something seen. It's a, it's a, it's a short, shorthand for, for, for an object. And that, that still interests me, and I think with respect to the, the period of minimal art, um, that, um, that, um, that banal sort of function of the photographic image is, um, is, is at stake and it corresponds very closely to the, to the language of the work. Um, and I'm also speaking in, in that context of um, photographs in many cases that artists, in most cases that artists didn't take. So even when it's photographs of their own work, it was in Morris's case, that they were made by somebody else. He directed them to a degree, he, he, re, he recalls, um, but he, he, he claims in any case that he, he gave the photographer very little direction and the purpose of the photograph was uh, was was um, for, um, for for showing the work. It, it, the photograph was a represent. It's supposed to be a kind of um, um, uh, a, a, a straightforward mugshot of a work in question, um, uh, such that it could be represented to um, to galleries in in, in New York. Um, but I'm I so I would I would also add though, with respect to um, how this question frames what what it is. I'm thinking about historically um, that I'm, I became very interested, above all, in the, car, in the course of this study project at the Guggenheim, in the way in which we often refer to these works through photographs and not the actual work itself, which I, I, came, I came to find was, um, it, it's, it shocked me, uh, because as, as I, as I un came to understand over time, so many of these things were, no longer exist or have been remade in so many different forms that we no longer have a stable idea of what it is we mean when we say corner piece or whatever. Um, so that's a, you know, and so it so it's, has to do with method, historical methodology too, what we do as historians when we speak of sculpture uh, and allow it to be mediated for us by photographs, which in fact it was at the time in, yeah, in, I mean, in strategic ways. I, I, I strongly agree with that last point about what we do as, what our, how our practice is how how we operate, um, but I don't. I have found that fact or that recognition to be um, very liberating, actually, and to realize that uh, I mean we or I at least uh, sort of came to my maturity in an, uh, at a moment when the idea was that you had a take in front of a particular object that you and it, you know something happened, you went away, you saw it, and that, that established your understanding of the work from then on out. And it took a long time for me to, to just to say, no, this is so untrue. You know, this does not really have anything to do um, with existence in a, in a mediated world, and moreover with the process of thought. It doesn't actually allow thought mm -hmm. to mature, to change, you know, it's, it's just, it just should be buried somewhere, kind of <laughs> deep <laughs> in one of Tarski's hills, because it's it does it's not it's not a functional description of the of um, writerly or, or a, indeed interpretive practice. Mm -hmm. and, yes, you go ahead. 
Can I, I just wanted to return to the, the question of the frontality of sculpture and the kind of rhetorical use of that in terms of minimalism. We started to talk for a minute about this um, exhibition called Other Primary mm. Structures, which was staged at the Jewish Museum, in which you had giant mural-sized um, photographs of other primary structures which are installed on scaffolds in the exhibition spaces and paired with works that spoke to a new idea of what a global art history is. And so the fact that Brazilian artists, Eastern European artists, Japanese artists, Korean artists were making hard-edged sculptures that looked like the sculptures that were in other primary structures was something that was on display. And, and this actually goes back to the first question about color. Um, what was really interesting about this is that it wasn't the frontality of your experience with the sculpture, but the frontality of your experience in front of the photographs of other pri of primary structures. Because the work was installed in such a way to make apparent these formal um, uh, affinities between this other, these others, um, geographic others, and the original primary structures show. But it only worked if you were there in front of these, um, these giant murals in certain positions. Um, and the other thing that happened is that you know, all of these images of that, um, of that important show are in black and white. And so the photo murals were in black and white. Of course, color, if you know anything about this exhibition, was, was absolutely key to the show. Um, so the work of the others, which is in the flesh, sculptures in the flesh, as it were, um, were very colored in contrast to you know, this, this kind of style of how we understand the 60s and 70s, this black and white photographs. And the effect, at least for me, was very much to turn the sculptures and the flesh into illustrations and sort of documents to some idealization of other primary structures. So I actually think that the kind of rhetoric of frontality emerges or re-emerges again in a very peculiar way to in fact, um, reassert the primacy of a certain canonical view of, of, of important sculpture, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is for Christopher. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. I was wondering, though, um, as the only panelist who addressed kind of non-Western ways of receiving photographs, um, how a point you made briefly at the beginning of your talk about these models of vision that are circulating um, in the communities you study uh, intersect with the photographic medium. Um, specifically, how this registers linguistically. Do they have metaphors for photography that we don't have? Or um, do they piggyback in a meaningful way with uh, terms for understanding sculpture and the sculptural encounter? Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well. Uh, Emically or um, ethno-sociologically speaking, um, photography is a much broader class than um, uh, would be allowed um, within um, Persian semiotics. Um, so almost all the images I showed would be described as photos. Um, so camera photos are a small subsection of that broader category of image. Um, so yeah, it's a very different, um, different landscape. Um, I mean, I ought to say that I'm in the rather delicate position of on the one hand wanting to present um, an emic uh, ethno-sociological view that directs attention towards that broader category, but I'm very happy to um, analytically, etically impose a Persian cutoff. So um, I showed you a lot of images which um, Theoretically, I think, um, from a Persian point of view, are not photographs. Um, so it's a question of strategically juggling um, different um, cultural classifications of imagery. Um, and I hope that um, by blurring that line, one could get more of a sense of the, um, the dynamic translational circuits through which these things kind of continually morph. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes has suggests that we should um, start using the term the morphotype. Um, so yeah, I've tried to give an account of morphotypes, uh, some of which um, a Persia might uh, accept as a photograph, um, almost all of which um, the people in central India I was describing would accept as photos, um, but that's a slightly different category. 
Um, and as I hope I also showed, um, uh, and this kind of takes us to uh, one of Anne's points, quite frequently the um, materiality of those photos is dramatically heightened by the accretion of objects on the surface of the image. Um, so that one of the other things that's going on here, which perhaps I haven't um, uh, stressed sufficiently, in addition to the um, overwhelming preference for frontality, the demand for the efficacy of these images. So the other thing that's happening here is that um, these images are not ever being relished for their um, patina and their historical sedimentation. They are ruthlessly thrown away when they cease to be efficacious. This is a very instrumental, pragmatic set of image practices in which people desire material benefit through worshipping these images. And that's usually dependent on having a relationship of visual mutuality with uh, frontally presented presences in these images. And so one of the ways in which you close the gap in that kind of efficacious circuit of biomoral flows is through these surface accretions, which is where a lot of photography ceases to be uh, particularly flat and starts to assume highly sculptural qualities. Um, so that's one of the other ways in which um, the kind of um, perhaps common sense assumptions that um, we might bring to the debate I think can be usefully um, complicated. I think maybe we have one more chance for one more question. Sally? <laughs> it's faded. Um, so I have a question that I think maybe you could all answer because I think it tracks through the course of the day, but particularly in thinking about um, Professor Small, your talk, um, and not the photographs you showed, but your introduction with uh, Lydia Clark and the sort of um, photographs that I'm thinking of are these ones where she seems somewhat strategically within her sculptures or posed with her work um, and tracking this sort of back to what Professor Grigsby introduced uh, and then maybe even a kind of absence of a kind of artist who makes or the person who's making uh, with Professor Weiss, um, how the sort of navigation of photography and sculpture together is also a sort of recognition of the sort of body that is called to perform as a kind of artist, uh, to go to sort of Vanessa's point as a sort of press, something that's dispersed to the press, to the world, a sort of body that sort of either needs to testify to making or to sort of disappear from the sort of process of making, right? And that's not exactly a question, but I'm wondering about that. I can say very quickly about Lisa Clark. Um, what's interesting there is that her work, along with other people like Yabi Tisika, was so much about, um, it, it was, people sometimes refer to them as performative, but in fact it was about dispensing with any notion of performance in favor of participation in the sense that it was the viewer who is the primary body that's involved. However, with Lisa Clark in particular, especially as she moves towards a therapeutic practice, her subjectivity and her initiative in creating a kind of relationship um, is very important. Um, the thing that I immediately thought of when you were speaking just now is the, there are these photographs that she made with the, um, that she had taken of the bee shows with herself, which partially she's sort of modeling how they work. Um, but there's also these little photographs um, that she makes with a maquette, um, a little doll, um, and she calls them monumental architecture. And this is, in my understanding, really a kind of thought experiment. Um, the fact that these exist um, as photographs and have now um, there's a kind of documentary evidence attached to them, has basically allowed the kind of foundation and the gallery to produce these giant, there's one at the Henry Moore Institute, I think, there was one at Art mm. Basel. Mm. Um, these giant sculptures which um, have none of the, the kind of experimentation that you understand the photograph to allow at that moment. Um, and so it's this kind of moment where the divorcing of her body, the suggestion that these objects can just sort of go into the world, mm. becomes attached to a very problematic kind of um, proliferation of, of forms in, in, in physicality, in physical form. I was thinking, um, in general, of course, I'm preoccupied with scale and the fact that uh, photographs don't give us enough information generally. It's, but I was also, so I was thinking about how different 
Andre's pyramid was from the, the little uh, cubes sure. of Mel Buckner. But um, <clears throat> it made me wonder about the human body, uh, sculpture that is figurative, and how it implies a scale, a size, even when, in the case of Rushmore, for instance, it's not, in fact, our size. But the diff when, uh, let's see, who was it? Sarah brought up the issue of the history of photography and, the, you know, the, and sculpture and how it's shifted. It does seem to me so primary what it is to shift from photographs of human bodies, which could include statuettes pretending to be human size, to, of course, the abstract vocabulary of the minimalist sculpture, et cetera, where that's potentially a lot of missing information. Mm. It's so interesting that so much of that work exists as documentary records, when in fact, in so many ways, it's inadequate in a way that we might think even Talbot's very early gestures with Patroclus kind of does quite a great job, especially if he did 55 of them. Um, so I, I, just to throw that into the... Do you know the, stat, the, the bust? I mean, how can you say it did a great job? I think it does a great job because I don't think it makes size seem to matter because I think there's a way that photographs of sculptures that are figurative, of, I mean, are of human bodies, we make assumptions about mm -hmm. them that are perhaps, you know, entirely right. dis about mistakes, as in seeing the statuettes as full scale. But we feel a kind of confidence and relationship that, again, it can be, I'm not implying that it's accurate, but I'm implying that it's satisfying. Well, okay, <laughs> but you, you, you did say, yeah. right, although you didn't use the word, that they were adequate. I, I mean, and, and that's part of my struggle here. I don't know what a document photograph is. I don't. Yeah. I, it's an unaffected photograph. It doesn't look at odd angles, all of that kind of thing. But what is a document? Well, that goes, no, that goes back to uh, Megan's question about whether we've got two, two strands here, one of which is this fantastic notion that we can reproduce the world. Mm. I have no idea what that could yeah. possibly mean. But why we, privilege the world as a prototype rather than well, look here. Ra rather than thinking about the photograph as a document of an event? I can so it might be that actually you hardly see the sculpture, but there's some effect of light, which is intrinsically photographic and successful. So, I mean, uh, I'm kind of puzzled. We're, we're, we're talking about, I thought, adequacy uh, in relation to a given object. If you take a picture of, um, under the may I answer the, the question? Event. Sorry, okay. thank you. Um, you take a picture of Charles Baudelaire. My claim is, in so doing, we do not reproduce Charles Baudelaire. If you take this piece of paper with type on it to a photocopier, in fact, you do reproduce it, given what we understand by reproduction. But there is a big difference between making a copy of a document and making a copy of the world. I, don't, I can't assign any given... But I thought Alex's faulty printer showed, uh, scanner showed us the, um, the uh, counter instance of I'm that. I'm not that saying actually... you can't go wrong in making a copy of a document. Of course you can. But you can't even start to make a copy of the world. This, uh, copy this room. How would, where would you begin? Yeah, but I think I wonder whether that's the only <laughs> I, think a, I think there's a problem with questions. But adequacy. isn't there a photographic event that give, might give you a plausible version of uh, some aspect of this? I, that would, I think we should probably take the debate outside, but before we do, um, Sarah and I want to just say a couple of remarks. So Sarah, just, if you'll just bear with us, we want to say a couple of brief things. Um, here's a moment where our collaboration almost fails because we can't have a singular voice to express our immense gratitude to everyone here today from um, everyone at the Getty, Rebecca and Nathaniel especially, for keeping us on time. Ish. <laughs> Ish. Our fault. Our fault. <laughs> um, uh, Vanessa for moderating and doing a wonderful job of posing us uh, questions to think about at the outset. All of our speakers um, for bringing such dedication to thinking about these problems with such depth. 
and um, our respondents, Anne and Alex, um, I, also, I just want to say that I'm so grateful to them both for being here today and um, bringing such tremendous thought to their responses. Their work has deeply impacted how Megan and I are thinking about these problems um, right from the start. So we're just so tremendously <coughs> grateful for, to them for, for coming um, and, and, and kind of allowing us to frame larger questions. So Megan. Yeah, and I'm, I obviously echo this um, as well. Both Anne and Alex have been incredibly generous with their time and efforts, as has Vanessa in supporting yeah. our collaborative project. And this is a phenomenal event to have launched um, our continued, in many ways, uh, to sort of debut our, our joint research on this. And I want to thank Sarah very much, too, as being a profoundly um, terrific collaborator to work with. But I also want to, again, stress how much I thank all our speakers, Britt, Jeffrey, Irene, <laughs> Darcy, Chris, Joel, and Jeremy for um, actually creating new work for the occasion of this um, symposium in pretty much um, just about every case, even if it was building on existing ideas, I think everybody took seriously the mandate to really not go through the motions, as sometimes can happen at a symposium, but to really um, tackle something almost Everybody said, I've never thought about this question before. I don't think I should be here. No, everybody <laughs> did a phenomenal and incredible job, and we really, really appreciate it. And thank you to the audience yes, and to the Getty.